I had a request for a talk yesterday, which I promised I would give today, by someone who was asking the question, is happiness really possible in our modern life? Or are we always going to have to have suffering and problems and difficulties in our life? So it's a talk about happiness. And uh, obviously that many of you know that uh, Buddhist monks are supposed to be the happiest people in the world. Uh, that was uh, the findings from Professor Davidson of Wisconsin University. And that's objective. In other words, that was found on a uh, functional magnetic resonance sc uh, scan of a person's brain. So surely that uh, Buddhists should know something about happiness and its causes. And for those of you who know basic Buddhism, that's the whole purpose of the Four Noble Truths. The basic teachings of the Buddha, you know, the heart of this thing we call Buddhism. You, know, you may say, and it's accurate to say, it's all about the Four Noble Truths. And you also know that the way I've been teaching these Four Noble Truths for many years now is the rearranging the Four Noble Truths and talking about happiness is cause. Sometimes uh, we aren't happy and why we're not happy. Those four uh, noble truths. Happiness, the cause of happiness, that sometimes we're unhappy, well, why we're unhappy. And that to me made so much sense when I was a young man because really I thought the essence of all religions was you know, basically the answer to two questions. You know, what is happiness and how do I get it? If I knew those two answers then you'd have all the religion you really wanted in the world. Uh, because all the other theories and uh, philosophies and theologies and all that sort of stuff was all very well to talk about but what I was really concerned with in my life was you know, the problem of happiness and suffering and how to overcome the suffering and find real true happiness. So you know, the question of you know, is there real happiness in this world you know, for personal experience I can say yes, there certainly is. Uh, real happiness, true happiness. But it's also fascinating in my life's journey to find that that happiness lies in places where people just don't even look. And it's because we don't look in those places that many people will live their whole life and never actually experience the deep, peaceful, wonderful happinesses which were uh, possible in life. But first of all, I'm sort of uh, saying about what happiness is and how to get it. Now I want to sort of start talking uh, in this little uh, uh, presentation today about well, why is it that sort of people have problems in life? You know, what is the, the cause of unhappiness in life? Why do people keep getting into these unhappy states? Certainly there is part of life which is beyond one's control. There are the difficulties and pains in life, the death of a loved one, the disappointments in one's career, the problems with one's children, the arguments with one's partner, the pain and sickness in the body, or just the basic uh, getting caught in traffic jams when you're on the way to the Buddhist society. The basic sufferings in life are there, but they're not the real sufferings. The point is that uh, one of the things which a Buddha says is it's the attachment, carrying those burdens around more than they should be. And that's where I'm going to start this uh, talk today. Why is it that people get attached to suffering? And that's basically what it is. Many years ago, I was privileged to give a talk at a grief and loss conference in Observation City. It was a national conference on grief and loss, all run by some psychologists and psychiatrists. And uh, I remember giving a presentation there, just after there had been a presentation by the parents of, I think, Kiera Glennon, one of the young ladies who was killed by the Claremont killer. They're still not found who exactly did that. And they were expressing just their pain at the loss of their daughter. I think a young girl, I think she was a lawyer, successful, beautiful, who just disappeared one night and her body was found some time later by the Claremont killer, whoever that was. And apparently that, that session, which I did not attend myself, created a great feeling of suffering and angst amongst the, the people in the, uh, the conference. And I came along with my usual positive attitude and how to deal with death. But it's not just my positive attitude because I had lived in Thailand for nine years and 
it's one of those uh, sayings which comes from my experience in nine years of, if you like, research and my research was actually attending funeral after funeral after funeral, cremation after cremation because our monastery in Thailand was a local cremation ground. We hang out with the ghosts which was actually a very peaceful place to stay. When I was wandering and you wanted to get away from people because when I was a monk I liked a bit of peace and quiet Ajahn Chah always used to tell us that when you want to stay somewhere at night time ask a local village where the cremation ground is it would be like an open area of forest and you go and stay there. It's the most peaceful place because the villagers are too scared to come and visit you. <laughs> so I really love those ghosts for protecting me. They were like my bodyguards, my minders to keep all the people away so I could meditate quietly and peacefully. So good on you ghosts. But that particular forest monastery, Wat Ba Nana Cha, that was like a ghost monastery because they had a cremation ground there but also I used to see now, so many funeral services, again and again and again. And because you were dependent upon those villagers for your alms food, you'd see them every morning. You'd go into their, their village. And these were the people you grew up with. I remember just, I was nine years in Thailand, mostly that monastery. When I came over here uh, to help start this uh, monastery over in Serpentine and you know, help support this uh, Buddhist Society of Western Australia. I think it was about four or five years before I had a chance to go back to that village. And as soon as I went back there, you know, getting back uh, into that monastery in the late afternoon, the first time the villagers knew I was there was when I went on arms round. And see all these you know, ladies and men, when they looked up, such a bomb, they start crying. Because you did become part of the village. And it was one of them had gone away for about four or five years and come back again. And that's actually how close you, you were knitted into that community. And I mention that point simply because it establishes the fact that I didn't just see these people at the funeral services. I saw them before, I saw them afterwards. These are the people I knew. And I never saw grief. I never saw people crying. It was actually once, I must admit, in all those nine years, that once I saw a tear, maybe just one or two drops of tears fall down the cheek of one lady who lost her husband. But apart from that, there was no solid grief like you see here in Western Australia. And it wasn't that it was suppressed, it was just people saw this from a different attitude. They weren't so attached to their loved ones. And to me it was a revelation, and what I said at the conference, that there is a difference, a separation between grief and loss. Loss will always be there, but grief is an added extra. And seeing a culture, and that northeast part of Thailand had not been affected by any other western influence. So it was like a pure old Buddhist culture. And when I actually saw just how that pure Buddhist culture related to a death, it was a revelation to see that there was a society where grief basically did not exist. And it showed me that our grief is a cultural addition. There is another way of looking at it. And why is it that we attach to that sort of suffering? And basically it's the same reason you may not agree with me with this, but I'm challenging you here. It's the same reason why it is that we go to see these weepy movies. Because we'd like to cry. We actually encourage these emotions inside of us. We like to feel emotional. There is a lady who comes here, she's not here this evening, thank goodness, but she once told me that her mother would always love going to see these weepy movies, these Chinese movies, and she described them to me. Apparently in the Chinese movies, and you know, there's enough people from Malaysia, Singapore, here, Hong Kong, that you know what I'm talking about. Boy meets girl, but boy never gets girl. Either the family or the imperial army or some other tragedy gets in the way. And in the end, sort of boy and girl sort of, you know, are killed or separated. And they know that's going to happen. 
Every movie is the same. It's always a sad ending. And so her mother would come back from the weekly trip to the movies with red eyes. She'd be crying all the way through and all the way home. And she asked, what the heck do you do that for? Oh, it's because it's nice to cry. Oh, it's so sad and so enjoyable to feel sad. <laughs> Now, that's not so funny because at this conference there's all these key experiences which I have in my life. And it was after I gave that little presentation on how to look at life and death in a different way so you don't have to be sad. A lady came up to me and said, what's wrong with being sad? Because she'd lost uh, a close relation in tragic circumstances and she'd been grieving about five or six years. And there's no way she would give up her grief. What I saw in that lady, she was attached to grieving. That was her, that was her persona. She would go to conference after conference, therapist after therapist. It was her identity to be the griever. And that's one of our big problems there. Sometimes we form our identities, we attach to that suffering and that's me. We become the victims and we enjoy, in a perverse way, being that victim. We enjoy the grief. It's one of the sayings of the Buddha, which you see again and again and again in the original teachings. He said in all these negative emotions, like grief, like anger, like jealousy, even like fear, he said there is a delight there. If there wasn't a delight, then people wouldn't get into the fear, or into the jealousy, or into the anger. Because you know that when you feel angry, sometimes people do feel the power. And it's like a heroin, or like a meth methamphetamine. You know, you're, in, you're empowered at that time. There is a delight in those states, which is why people get into being angry, or into being violent into being jealous, or actually even into being grief. There is a delight there. And this is one of the wonderful sayings of the Buddha, because there is a delight there, that's why people will attach to those things. But the reason why they don't let go is because they see the delight, but they don't see the danger. You know, with anger, yeah, you get a high, but you have to pay for that afterwards, it's like a drug. And many of the other negative emotions which we have, like jealousy, yeah, you get a sense of you know, being the one left out, but you have to pay for it afterwards. Grief, you feel that, yeah, that you are the victim, but my goodness, how much you have to pay. And it's those attachments to those negative emotions, and especially the attachment to the pain of the past, that stops us being free to be happy. This morning I went to a, a little conference run by the Catholic Education Society or Centre. It was for the, the teachers in the Catholic education system. And it was about reconciliation and forgiveness. And there's some very good speakers there, from an assistant commissioner to Michelle Stubbs, who's a coordinator, think of the victims of child abuse. It's like a huge problem in our modern society. How many people have been sexually or physically abused when they were children? And how the heck do we deal with that? And what was being suggested was, and this is an interesting thing, that many of those victims of child sexual abuse feel that they need to have their day in court to be heard, to have their pain acknowledged, and to have some sort of retribution. Our society uh, asks for more than retribution, asks for punishment, jail sentences, long jail sentences. Some people would want you know, corporal punishment or even executions. But on part of that debate, I was sitting next to a Catholic priest who told me an anecdote from the United States where some of the relations of a person who was, I think, killed, murdered, attended the execution 
of their relations of loved ones murderer. And after witnessing the execution, came back and said the execution was too fast. It should have been slower. Oh, that really sort of hurt me so much. They wanted pain. They wanted suffering in the person who killed their, I don't know, child or relation or whatever it was. He never gave the details. What is it in a human being wants to harm others because they have harmed us? I say that's this attachment to being a victim. Attachment, you know, to all this cultural way of looking at things. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you know, is still very, very strong in many people in our society. And when I was asked, you know, what does Buddhism think about things like that? I sort of quoted a, a book uh, which I read as a student, which changed much of the way I looked at you know, being a victim or crime and punishment. And I've mentioned that here before, but it's a wonderful book written over a hundred years ago. It's called Error One by Samuel Butler. And apparently uh, that really influenced the great British playwright George Bernard Shaw. It changed the way he looked at to, to some of these social problems. And the reason why it was a very effective argument you know, against the way we treat sort of, if you like, criminals or people who've done harm you know, with uh, punishment was that it, it used a satire. It envisioned, envisaged a society in which you know, what we call crime today is looked upon as being a sickness and therapy, therapy, therapy is the only response to crime. If somebody steals, they go and see a doctor. If somebody rapes, that's looked as upon as being a sickness. Punishment is not really looked at at all, but somehow a rehabilitation of trying to work out and to remedy that sort of glitch in human nature. But when it came to health matters, if you were sick and ill, that was because you were careless and you were punished. And part of that book, a chapter which I will always remember, was of a court scene in which there was a poor man who had a cold. And when he had a cold, there's many colds going around right now, there's a cough already, you'll be in trouble in this society. Because he had a cold, he was in the dock, charged with being sick. And <laughs> because he was snivelling, uh, he had no defence, and so the judge pronounced him guilty of having a cold. And he, uh, before he gave uh, judgment, a uh, sentence, sorry, in the punishment, he said, this is not the first time you've appeared before me. You were here last week or three weeks ago with the cold. I warned you then, if you don't eat better, take better care of your health, let go of your stress, it's your responsibility to be healthy and you have been negligent and your cold is causing a danger to other people. You're being heedless, you're not caring for others, you're spreading your germs to other people, that's not appropriate, you should be punished three years in jail for having a cold, being a repeat offender. <laughs> There's some logic to that. In a sense, you know, if you are sick, isn't it your responsibility to exercise and eat well and keep yourself healthy? And if you are sick, you are a scourge on society. You're robbing it of all these resources. You heedless, uh, scallywag, retrobate, delinquent for always having colds. And they were punished. Now, obviously, what that really made very, very clear to me is that the double standards which we have. Why is it that when we're sick, no one gets punished for being sick? And what's the difference between some of the behaviour of human beings which we call criminal? So when I was asked I, about what do we think in Buddhism about punishment, it was very much the case that 
Yes, sometimes it's like a sickness, you do need quarantine to be put away so you don't harm other human beings for the time that sickness is still strong in you and you're still a danger to others. But when you're in quarantine, it's never looked upon as being a punishment, it's always looked upon as being rehabilitating. To try and take that problem, to work with it so it's no longer there. And you stay in quarantine as long as you are contagious, a danger to society. In the same way. Why don't we look at that as penal reform, to stay as long as you are a danger to society, but not looked upon as being a punishment, look upon as being a problem which needs to be healed. No punishment, but rehabilitation. That's how I understand Buddhism over the many, many years of being a Buddhist, and also how I understand the positive way forward. But why is it that people want, don't want that? They want people to be punished for their way they've hurt us. And I think it's very much that we can't just understand deeply why it is that people do these terrible things, why they make these mistakes, to have a deeper understanding and also have a deeper understanding not just where these crimes, these hurts, these harms come from, but how in the future we can lessen the chance of harm and hurt. But being attached to being a victim does not help. And sometimes uh, I just wonder why people want punishment of others. When if you're a Christian, you know that God will punish afterwards. What do you need to punish for? If you're a Muslim, Allah will look after it. If you're a Buddhist, karma will look after it. And if you don't believe in any religion, you know that person will have to go into psychotherapy for many, many years afterwards. Whatever it is, no one ever escapes from the problems of their bad behavior. It's one also one of those insights which I had from experience of visiting prisons many times in the early part of my life here in Western Australia. Visiting prisons so many times and getting to know some of these uh, people spending years in jail Never once did I find a prisoner who had no conscience. They would act as if they had no conscience and think, yeah, when I get out of here I'm just going to rob as many houses as I can. I don't care about the system, I'm just going to bear with this until I can get out. But when I got to know some of these prisoners, they would always, in every case, express just how bad and terrible they felt about what they'd done to others. It wasn't a case they never felt deep inside the hurt which they had given to others. They always felt it. There was always remorse there. It just usually it was a tough guy syndrome. They did not want to express it. So there is always a punishment comes there. If someone has done something bad to you, they are going to hurt. It's what we call the law of karma. It has to come back to them. And that is not whether you're a Buddhist or a Christian or whatever. You know, that's a law like the law of gravity. You don't have to sort of believe in that or not believe in it. It happens irrespective of your beliefs. So we don't need to punish others. Instead, we can let the whole thing go. And unless we let them go, then we are a victim for the rest of our lives. It doesn't matter who has harmed, hurt, abused you. Until you can let that go, you're always the victim and you can never be free. It's just how we can reach that point of letting go. And sometimes just to think we need to confront that person who's harmed us. We need to fix the situation ourselves. We need to be acknowledged, we need to be heard sometimes that cannot be achieved. If it's not achieved, then what? Sometimes you don't need to be hurt. Sometimes you don't need to confront the person who's harmed you or hurt you. You are always free and every moment, independent of others, independent of the judicial system, independent of where that person who harmed or hurt or abused you is, you're always free to let go at any time.
These attachments which we carry around, we choose to carry them. We don't have to. The experience of seeing how grief was not a part of the Buddhist culture, hundreds of years old in Northeast Thailand, taught me that many of the things I thought were normal, natural and had to happen, were not normal, natural and had to happen. It's just the way we've learned to deal with the problems of life. And we can relearn them and do things in a different way. If someone has harmed and hurt you, why not let it go pretty quickly? I've often said, and this is just a start of understanding how to reconcile, let go, forgive, let go, move on. I've often said that when someone calls you an idiot and you keep thinking, why did they call me an idiot? I'm not an idiot. You should not call me an idiot. You've allowed them to call you an idiot three more times. <laughs> Every time you remember that, you're allowing them to call you an idiot another time. So why not when they call you an idiot, you forget it straight away. Then they only call you an idiot once. They're wrong, you know they're wrong, end of problem. Now I think many of you would accept the wisdom of that. And maybe you've heard it enough times, you've done that already. People call you an idiot, they call you foolish, they call you ugly, they call you stupid. You just forget it straight away. Or for those of you who don't know this wonderful saying of Ajahn Chah, if they call you a dog, what should you do? Look at your you know, bow. <laughs> Very good, you got there first, excellent. But, no, that's not what Ajahn Chah said. If someone calls you a dog, you should look at your bottom to see if you've got a tail. If you ain't got a tail, you're not a dog, end a problem. And most of the things which people say about you aren't true, because they don't know who you are, what you're doing. So that's a great way of stopping the problem. But what a lot of people do, they keep thinking about it. Every time you think about it, you allow them to call you a dog another time. Now that's easy to understand. But what about someone who's really hurt you? Really abused you? Even like sexual abuse as a kid? Is it the case that every time you remember that, you allow them to abuse you again? every time you really bring that up? Why is it we can't let it go straight away? It's hard, but with an inner strength, you know, a strength which is not coming from willpower, but from wisdom power, from compassion, why do we allow ourselves to be victims, to be made victims? And I'm not just saying that out of theory. Many, many years ago, there was a disciple. Uh, this was in the time of the, the Armadale group, part of the Armadale group, who came up to me. Actually, one of her friends said, you better talk to her because she's in big trouble. And what the trouble was, was she found out her husband was sexually abusing her two children. She had missed it. And I told her why she missed it, because look, you love that man. And when you love a man, the signs are there, but you are in denial because the whole idea that the man you love is abusing the children you love, it just, it's so hard to reconcile that. It's so hard for the mind to fit those two together. So she just denied the signs of sexual abuse of her children by her husband. It was found out by the school investigated, it was true. The guy went to jail. The marriage was over. And I was counselling her. Counselling her on these Buddhist principles. She had been meditating enough, she understood the basic idea of karma, letting go, and not being a victim. And she took it on board. And she said she can never live with that man or love him again but she's not going to allow him to make her suffer anymore. She completely let go, wished him well, and eventually moved to the UK. And I kept in contact with her and her kids. But before she left, it was compulsory at that time, probably still is, for her to go for counselling. And the kids too. And I was sort of quite amused 
that after going to counselling for about four or five weeks, she came to complain again. So this counsellor will not understand, I've moved on. And the counsellor was still saying, you hate your husband, don't you? He said, no, no, I don't hate the husband, I've let him go. You hate him, don't you? No, I don't. And she came because she could not be free of her counsellor until <laughs> she admitted how much she hated and wanted to kill her husband. And so I had to write this letter to the counsellor about Buddhist psychology and how Buddhists relate to these things, to actually to free her. And I didn't write this letter easily, because if I got it wrong, then this lady would be suffering later on down the track. But because I knew her, because I taught with her, because I counselled her myself, I knew that she hadn't moved on. She did not have that anger. She didn't go through this process of victimhood, which is expected in our modern culture. She moved through fast, and so gained her freedom fast. And I really salute her, because what she did, by moving from sort of that incredible hurt, her whole life being devastated, she moved so quickly through that, not into forgetfulness, not into ignorance, that didn't happen, not into denial. But yeah, that happened, that was an awful thing to happen, but I'm not going to allow that to hurt and harm me anymore. Because she moved into that sort of freedom, she took her two kids with her very quickly. They too followed their mother's lead, were not going to be victims, and moved on. There are other ways of dealing with these terrible abuses. And the other personal example I have, again, is the story of my own father, who told me that he was, before the Second World War, born and brought up in Liverpool, on a very, very poor family, as most people were in those days. And his father was a plumber who would go to work before he came home, spend most of the time in the pub, spending the money, giving only pittance to my, uh, my maternal grandmother, my paternal grandmother, sorry, to look after the kids. And as soon as he'd come home drunk, would get out his belt and whip any kid who came in his path for no reason or another, and then set on his wife. Which is why my father, you know, in my presence, he said, look, I'm sorry, son, you know, your grandfather was a bastard. And he hated him. But the other thing I, he told me was that whenever he was under that belt himself, you know, being sort of beaten for no reason at all, except his father was drunk, he made a resolution, he told me, he determined if ever he gets through this and has kids, he will never hit them. And that's what happened. There's no way that my father could hit us. My mother had to be the disciplinarian, and even she didn't do it very well. <laughs> and he became this incredibly loving father. He was a person, in that story I tell you about you know, taking me down a side street of Acton in London and telling me, look, whatever you do in your life, son, the door of my house will always be open to you. What I later interpreted as being, whatever you do in your life, wherever you go, the door of my house, my heart will be open to you. It was unconditional love. And that was a man who suffered tremendous physical abuse as a child. There is other ways of dealing with these things. And I look at that as a way forward. Whereas if we carry that abuse around with us, we become victims. We are stopping ourselves being happy. We don't have to. Which is, if it happens, great, but there has to come a time, some situation where we let go. Sometimes that letting go does happen when you know, we face the person who has you know, been uh, hurting us, creating that problem. We face them and we hear them acknowledging it. Sometimes there is a letting go there. And maybe that might be the only way, the best way, but sometimes that way isn't there for us. If it's not there for us, that we can do it ourselves. We can move on by letting go of this burdens. And when we say that, you know, 
is there happiness in this world? Unless we drop those attachments to the pain of our lives, to the disappointments, to what went wrong, to the heart, the hurt and the heart, if we can't drop those attachments, how on earth can we ever be free? At this conference this morning, there was a very impressive um, young Aboriginal leader. I forget her name, Narelle was her first name. She was actually a basketball star or something. But uh, she was uh, saying, it's a very interesting thing. So if our Prime Minister John Howe says sorry, she said, then what? She was telling her students, she teaches at Clontar, have you got to wait until the government says sorry before we can reconcile and move forward? Why leave them that sort of power? Why don't we do it now? I thought that was a, a very inspiring and wonderful way of taking responsibility for ourselves for our moving out of our victimhood rather than waiting for someone else to do it forward for us, whether it's the government, whether it's the courts, whether it's karma or whatever. Why can't we take responsibility for being free? And say, I forgive. I let go. I will move on. I'm never going to allow anyone else ever again to control my happiness. You've heard me say that before. It's a very simple thing to say. Don't allow others to control your happiness. It's a very powerful thing to say. It's very profound. And you can see just how much of our lives is controlled by others. And part of Buddhism, I say, is always empowering. Empowering you to take control of your happiness. And it can be done. Too often we look for solutions in controlling others. Or the problem lies with my abuser, the problem lies with the government, the problem lies with some, somewhere else, the problem lies with my husband, the problem lies with my cancer, the problem lies with my loved one who's just died. If you want to sort of try and fix up the world by fixing up all those people around you who hurt you or harmed you, Perhaps you will die before that problem is solved. Perhaps even if you get reborn many, many times, you will never find that freedom, that happiness, that peace. Fortunately, you don't have to go that path. There's one beautiful message of the Buddha. You cannot really change this world, but you sure can change your attitude towards it. The abuse which you've had in the past, you can't change that. The pain, the difficulty, the loss, the person who's just died, you can't bring them back again. That's obvious, but sometimes obvious, but we still think that way. We can't undo the abuse. We can't sort of get back that youth which we may have lost. We can't undo things. We can't change the world of the past. But what we can do is change our attitude in this present moment. And it's that attitude change which is the key I've always found to finding freedom and happiness. To find happiness and freedom just in our world, rather than changing the world first so that sometime in the future we can be free that we can be happy, we can be at peace. And that's not a cop-out, because sometimes people say, well, if you don't do anything, you know, there'll be more abuse, more cheating, more uh, stupid governments, more wars, you know, more child abuse, more crime. And, and the psychology which I know, that the more time you have blame, the more time you have punishment, the more time you exert revenge, that it makes the whole problem worse and worse and worse and worse. The more people you lock in jail, the more criminals we have for our future. The more you punish, the more people have resentment. 
quicker you can forgive, the quicker there can be rehabilitation. Not just for the victims, but the people who did those terrible things. Some few years ago, I should have kept this article because it was a brilliant article. It was concerning the killers of Jamie Bulger, Bulger, whatever his name was. This young, is it two or three year old, who was abducted in a shopping centre in Liverpool, tortured and killed on a railway track by some, was it eight or nine year old children? And the whole culture of England at the time, especially driven by the tabloid press, was wanting the blood of those two killers. Now, even though they were very, very young, they'd done a terrible, terrible thing to take the life of a two-year-old. And it's not just one person's death, it's all the tears and the anxiety and the stress and the devastation of all of the people who knew that child, let alone the parents. But what I never knew at the time was pointed out in this article was that at about the same time a similar event happened in Norway in the town of Trondheim, north of Oslo where I think two boys had lured I think a girl into the snowfields and had similarly killed her. And the similarities between the crimes were very close. But what was very dissimilar was the way those two societies dealt with the problem. As many of you know with the Jamie Bulger case, those two kids were put into some detention center and the tabloid press just wanted them to be really punished hard and the parents were just waiting for them to be released so they could kill them. And even the public just did not want them to be released. I read in the newspapers there was some idea of sending them to Australia where they wouldn't be known, new identities, so they could live their life. And the British public was saying, no, they don't deserve any freedom. That's what I read. With these other two kids, the following day after they were caught, they both went to school. Accompanied by psychiatrists and social worker. They were not put into any punitive institution. Very, very soon, the mother and father of the child who died came to a closure, came to forgiveness and moved on in their life. Whereas the parents of Jamie Borger had never moved on, as far as I know. And the whole town of Trondheim sort of came to a closure. They realized it's a terrible act, but the only way to move forward is not to wish harm on the killers. And so many years later, one of the killers of, that I think it was a little girl in Trondheim, was perfectly well adjusted, having a successful life, completed the education, had really moved on, so did the family and the rest of the town. There's one of the killers still had social problems and some psychological problems, but nowhere near like the pain which was spread around England because of the Jamie Bulger case. To see those two separate accounts of a similar tragedy, one where there were many victims and their victimhood was I dare to say cherished and attached to and made much of. And the other one where rehabilitation was the, the main aim and goal. To see the effects of those two cases, I sure wish I lived in Norway than in England. That was the way forward, the way that everyone got healed, the way there was less pain, less suffering. So, when we are not happy, when we are suffering, when we are not free, why is it? It is because we don't know how to move on from the pains and difficulties and stresses of life. Now these are big pains, 
big problems, big sufferings. You probably haven't had to experience that degree of suffering. But if those people can move on and find freedom, why can't we? One of the great causes for happiness is the ability to forgive, to let go, to move on. It causes happiness for the offenders. I don't mean because they got away with it. No one gets away with anything in this world. But it means that they've got a way forward. And certainly a way forward for those people we call the victims. We have more freedom and happiness. Which is why I keep telling, why is it that we carry the shit around of the past and we don't carry the eggs in that story of the two chicken farmers, which I won't repeat because I think I'll tell that every couple of weeks here. It's an interesting thing, why is it that our nature always to look at the past and collect the pain, to go to the movies and want to weep, to look to be worried by watching too many soap operas, if people haven't got enough worries in their life, they create more worries by you know, watching what's happening in neighbours, by worrying who's going, to watch, who's going to win the cricket, or who's going to win the soccer, or who's going to win the footy. And people love the nail-biting finishes. Or if they don't like those, they go to these extreme sports. And sometimes, I remember being in the airport in Bangkok and I saw on the big TV screen there some of these extreme sports people were doing. Now I remember seeing sort of, uh, they were doing um, these motorbike races on ice. That's crazy, what idiot would actually race each other on these ice tracks? And sure enough, one person came off the bike, they had to have spikes on the wheels and got spiked. Wow, what do they do things like that for? Why do people do that? Just people like to suffer. Why do they like to suffer? They like the thrill, the excitement, there is a delight in suffering. Be careful. If you delight in suffering, there's no way you can ever be happy. If you attach to being the victim, if you just want the thrill of being hurt, or being on the edge of being hurt, how ever can you be free? So one of the ways of happiness in this world is able to notice why one can't detach from that which is generally painful and difficult to bear with. Why do we become the victim? Why do we become the sad one? Why do we sometimes we become the sick person? And this is interesting in some monasteries I've been in. You see if people become sick and sick and sick and sick. And a lot of monks say it's because they want to leave, they want to disrobe, that's the only way they know how of doing it. They actually become attached to being the sick one. That's their persona. It's called ego attachment. It creates a sense of self. And this is what the Buddha, one of the things the Buddha kept on pointing to. to who do you think you are? What do you take as yourself? What is your ego? You know, if you had wrote a list of who you were, what your attributes were, not in theory but in practice, and you wrote them down, how many of those things would be, you know, the angry person, the victim, the person who was abused, the person who was divorced, the person who was sick, the person who's had the mastectomy? How many of you take that to be yourself? There's a problem there, because the Buddha noticed, if you identify with being that, if you become that, you repeat it. This is this sense of identity. It's one of the reasons why when I did go into prisons to visit prisoners, again, I never called them criminals, as you heard me say before, just people who've done crimes. And I kept on telling the people in jail, you are not a criminal, you're a person who's done a crime, you're not a criminal, you're something bigger than that. Never think of yourself as a criminal, you're a person who's done a crime. 
Don't identify with that terrible act which you did. If you make that sense of self with your crime, if that's who you think you are, you are the burglar, you are the killer, you are the rapist, you become that. Which means when you get released, you'll do it again. Because that's who you are. You're the rapist, you're the killer, you're the adulterer, you're the child abuser. This is psychology, which I know because I've gone deep into my mind and seen the way that minds work. If you are, you make an identity of who you think you are. That's how you relate to the world. That's who you become. That's what you repeat. That's what's expected of you. So of course, that's what you do. And there we get the repeat of the harm and the hurt again and again and again and again. Why well, my father never thought of himself as the abused child. So that's why he never repeated the abuse on me. Why well, a person who just forgives, lets go, does not become the victim, becomes free and can live. The last story was a story which, uh, again, many of these stories you've heard here before, but I usually try and bring them together in one talk, which is on this one subject, simply because that it fits and this talk goes outside and gets put on CDs and it's nice to be complete. And this was a story of those two Australian soldiers meeting together in a reunion. They'd both been in the Second World War. They'd both been in Singapore, the fall of Singapore, and both been put in POW camps. When one met the other, they said, have you forgiven the Japanese yet for what they did to us and our friends? No, never. How can you forgive that? Said one of the soldiers. What about you? His friend said, I forgave years ago, but you, my friend, are still in the POW camp. I love that story, simply because until you forgive, until he forgave what those guards, those soldiers did to him and his friends in the camps in Changi, on the death railway in Thailand, on the Burmese border, until they forgave, they were still being tortured. They were still in the camps. They could never be happy. His friend had let go and therefore he was free. So when it comes to happiness, you don't have to be controlled by what others do to you. You don't have to be limited in prison, in jail, by the crimes which have been perpetrated on you in the past. You don't even have to worry about the crimes which you've done. I'm not talking about against the law, but the harm and hurt which you have done to others. I don't know how many people feel guilty about some of the things they've done. I've mentioned a few of those things I always felt guilty about. You know, playing my Jimi Hendrix records too loud to my father. You know, while he was playing his Sinatra records. Never really sort of you know, being a really good son to him. Never sort of, uh, you know, selling those encyclopedias when I was a kid. You know, and getting someone actually to buy an encyclopedia, just a rubbish book. I don't know why they even bought that, but I made them buy it. And all those sort of terrible things you did as a kid, you know, oh, gee, what did I do those for? So easy to feel guilty about the smallest of things. Why not? Why can't we just let them go, learn from them and move on? Until you do, you can never be free and never be happy. And this is not a small thing. You can never really be virtuous and good until you're free. And as far as meditation is concerned, there are how many people I've taught meditation to, and they get to a certain point in happiness and peace, and they can't go any further, and they kept coming back to the same complaint. I don't think I deserve to be so happy. I don't think I deserve to be at peace. I don't think I deserve to be enlightened, basically. And really that's another dagger to my heart. Why not? 
if all I do in my life as a monk, teaching here Friday nights or going overseas, if that's all I ever give to you, the conviction that you deserve to be happy, that you deserve to be free, that you deserve to be enlightened, you don't feel so guilty, you don't attach to those painful things in the past, that you are free, you can let go, both of other people's harm and your own harm as well. Be able to forgive yourself and forgive others. What it, that means is giving yourself the gift of freedom. And it, no one else can do that for you. Look, a Jesus can't forgive, a monk can't forgive, a Buddha can't forgive, a God can't forgive. Only you can forgive you. No one else. All these other people, they can encourage, they can teach, they can lead, they can inspire. But in the end it's up to you. And one day, one day you'll do that. This life, the next life or some life. You look at all your past, all the hurt, all the harm. And let it go. Say to yourself in those words of my father, whatever I have done in my life, what other people have done to me? The door of my heart is open to me. Fully, absolutely, happiness, freedom come in. To be able to invite freedom in, invite happiness in. There's a liberation there, which is why very often the Buddha called those enlightenment experiences liberations, freedom from suffering, freedom from pain, freedom from the past. Why do we carry the past around so heavily on our back? Because that's what being a victim is. I was telling people in Melbourne, I just came back from Melbourne on Thursday, Wednesday night, I'm just reminiscing because someone asked, what was it like being a monk in Thailand many years ago? And I was reminiscing about <laughs> the, the most, one of the most wonderful times I had in Thailand when after five years I left my monastery with all my possessions on my back. And that wasn't many possessions. Because you had to walk. And you had no place to go. You could go to any monastery and have a bed for the night. Any village in the morning with your bowl and get some food in it. You were completely free. You could any tree, you could just sit underneath it, put your mosquito net there, meditate, sleep. It was literally like being a bird. But better than being a bird, a bird always has to hunt for their food. For me, I knew any place, any village I went to, there was food there for me. And it was such a freedom because I was attached to no place and to no thing. Every crossroads I got to, I could go forward, go left, go right, or just turn around and go back. I had no duties, nothing compelling me to go in any directions. No duties, no burdens, no things to do, no unfinished business. It's a complete freedom, it's physically the most freedom I've ever felt. And everything you owned, you had with you. My bowl, my mosquito net, an umbrella, water pot, spare set of robes, and that was all. You could wander wherever you wanted. There's so much freedom. I always remember that that's the same freedom which you can have in your mind at any time. Any crossroads you come to in life, you go whichever way. Because you're not burdened by the past. You're not carrying baggage. And how much baggage do people carry in this life? Mostly it's the baggage of our past, our history. What happened to you? Who did what to you? Who said what? If you want happiness, let go. Free your past. 
at the very least, free the pain of the past and keep the happy memories. At least that way you're carrying enjoyable baggage. But even better to leave it all behind. There is such thing as happiness in this world. And the happiness is no one else's responsibility. It's yours. And that happiness is there for you at any moment, at any time. There is a door which is open from the cell, which is sometimes what your life feels like, being in a prison of your past, of what happened to you, of your body, your pain, your sickness, the pain which has happened to you. That's like being in a prison. But it's a prison whose door is always open. Always open. It's just sometimes we don't know how to walk through it. Sometimes we think we're not supposed to walk through it. And here I tell you, walk, be free, let go. There is such a thing as happiness in life. There is such a thing as freedom. There is such a thing as forgiveness and reconciliation. There is such a thing as such love that you can free yourself and free others and let go. And that freedom and that love is not a copping out of life. That is the heart of a positive response. Free yourself and you show the way to freedom for others. And much of the pain and the cause of pain in life, as the Assistant Commissioner said today, some like 80 or 90 percent, he was saying of people in the prisons in Western Australia have themselves been victims of child abuse because they could not forgive, because they could not let go, because they could not find freedom now they're in jail, having also caused pain to others. So what is the way forward? I think I've just shown it to you. To have the guts to see things in a different way, to free oneself. You don't need to feel grief. You don't need to feel that pain. You can walk out whenever you want. It's called freedom, the path to happiness. So that's the talk this evening on is it possible to be happy? Yes, that's one of the ways how. Okay, so any questions or comments there? I hope it's been challenging. I hope a few people disagree with me. Otherwise, I didn't challenge hard enough. Any comments or questions about the talk this evening? Maybe that's just something just for you to contemplate and see later on if it makes sense or not. No, no comments, questions? Okay, we'll